إني ألقى الإيناس في صومي وصلاتي ودعائي للرحمن وجميع الطاعات. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Uh, today what I'm going to be talking about is I'm going to be talking about the differences between Sunnis and Shia. And this is something which people need to know, to be educated about, be informed about. And also it's, it's an important thing for the truth seeker to be able to have access to. So uh, without further ado, ado, I'm just going to talk about something that the Sunnis or other people from maybe a non-Muslim perspective would think about when they think about Shia. So what they think about is things like Mota marriage was maybe temporary marriage. Uh, taqiyya, which is the ability for or the allowance for Shia to be able to lie yani, uh, in certain s- situations, and maybe potentially the the Mahdi, the Mahdi uh, for the Shia is obviously different in character and in description than the Mahdi for the Sunnis, uh, and potentially they they might be acquainted with uh, the fact that you know Shias believe that Ali should have been the successor to the Prophet and Sunnis believe that, the, uh, that Abu Bakr should have been the successor to the Prophet. When people think about the differences between Sh- Sunni and Shia, these are the kind of things that come into or crop into your mind. Um, I want to say something to you guys. I think these are not actually the primary differences between Sunni and Shia. But the primary differences between Sunni and Shia, I would say, Allah Alam, are three. Number one is the status of the Quran. Number two is the uh, Sahaba. And number three, or the companions of the Prophet, and number three is Imama. These are three things which I would say are the pillars of difference between Sunnis and Shia. So I'm mentioning these things not to cause uh, a fitna or corruption in the land or something like this. I'm mentioning these things because it's the right of the consumer to understand these differences when conceptualizing Islam in general. Now, the first thing we're going to talk about quickly is the Qur'an. Now, the Qur'an clearly is, Muslims believe, sent down to the Prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, etc. But being honest here, I have to be honest, that when you look into the classical Shia scholarship, uh, it's very clear that there's a difference of opinion between the scholars in Shia in the Shia school of thought, uh, especially the Twelve uh, Shia school of thought, as it relates to the preservation of the Qur'an. So there are these who take the, the Islamic position that the Qur'an is preserved and sent down the Prophet and the things that we've been reiterating and it's on our channel so you can refer to it. And those Shia who basically don't take the Islamic position uh, and this is in their scholarship and they don't basically believe that the Qur'an is preserved because they don't see that the Sahaba or the companions have done a good job in preserving the Qur'an. Uh, and of course some of the, uh, it's the, the classical scholars, I can quote them, are people like a Tobrosi, who actually wrote a book um, called, in in translation, the Fasl al-Khitab, basically the final say, fi tahrif kitab Rabbul Arbab, the in the in the lack of or the corruption of the book of the Lord of the Lords, which here means obviously uh, Allah. So this is one example. Al Khomeini in in uh, his book. Kashf al Asrar, he also mentions the fact uh, in uh, page 117 that the, he believes that the Quran is not uh, preserved. However, this shouldn't be said without also saying uh, that there are other people like Ali Kamil, uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, Kamel, sorry, Ali Kamel, one of the Shiuch, one of the uh, Shia Shiuch, have said that the Quran is preserved. So there are two different. Uh, uh, of opi- there are two kinds of opinions that exist within Shias. Clearly now, those who have the opinion that the Qur'an is preserved, which I genuinely believe are the majority. I genuinely believe, I personally believe, are the overwhelming majority. But, um, because I would love to believe that, and I think that is true, but it's very difficult to find out uh, through sociological studies if that's true or not. Those who do believe that the Qur'an is preserved, and that the Quran is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's sent down to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu which is the normative Islamic position. Those who have that Islamic position, we can then talk about the second uh, thing which we're going to segue into now uh, with a bit more uh, conviction. Number two here, which is what we said we were going to talk about in terms of the, the steps, is the status of the Sahaba. The Sahaba what is the what are, who are the Sahaba? The Sahaba are basically the companions of the Prophet. The companions of the Prophet. 
A sahibi is a companion. The sahaba are the companions. Uh, Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah describe a sahabi as someone who has met the Prophet, man laqiyan nabi, whoever has let the, met the Prophet, and he's a wakana mu'minan, and he's a, he was a Muslim, or she was a Muslim, uh, and wa mata ala dhalik, and then died upon this, i.e. Islam. So, a sahabi according to Islamic, the Islamic tradition, or the, sorry, the Ahlul Sunnah al-Jama'ah tradition, is someone who has met the Prophet, died upon Islam, and there's nothing to show that he's not a Muslim. Now, from a Sunni perspective, the Sahaba are seen as the transmitters of the, the revelation, by both the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Now, if, um, if we do take the Shia position, which I'm going to outline in a second, then we would, if we take our skeptical extreme to its max, we could actually say that the Qur'an would be corrupted. But having said this, what do the Shia say? I mean, if you look at Al-Kafi, which is the second most authoritative book, Usul Al-Kafi, and it's actually three sections. Al-Kafi is divided into three for the Shia, uh, Usul Fura, etc. If you look at Al-Kafi, which is the second most authoritative book for the uh, for Shia, you'll find that it says in Al-Kafi, and I'll put the references maybe in the description box, that can uh, the, that basically... The companions of the Prophet were Ashab Riddah illa Thalatha, that they were uh, apostates except for three. And they mention who the three are. Uh, and they say it was Al Maqdad, and it was Abu Dhal al Ghifari, and it was Salman al Farisi. These are the three uh, companions which are not apostates, according to uh, the Shia tradition. Of course, in addition to Ahlul Bayt, who, um, who are the, the, the family, the immediate family of the Prophet, who they would say is Hassan, Hussein, Fatima, etc. Now, these are big differences here, because once again, if you concede that the Sahaba are Kuffar, uh, and this is exactly what one of the Shia scholars says in one of his books, um, he actually wrote a book, and he, he entitled one of the, uh, the chapters, Kufr uh, al-Thalatha, or, uh, he, basically, not only do we talk about the, the disbelief of the Sahaba in general, but the Shias make specific intentions, uh, specific takfir, or specific, um, some Shias make specific takfir to Abu Bakr, Uthman, Ali, uh, Ali, no, Ali, Abu Bakr, Omar, and Uthman. They make specific takfir to these three, meaning that they say that these people are not Muslims because they usurped Ali from his rightful. Uh, right to have, um, you know, the, uh, the the successorship of the Prophet. We, this is basically the, Shi the Shia position. So once again, if you take this position, you could fall into the the, the first category of people who denied the Quran's preservation. But in addition to that, there's a, there, there are lots of other problems. Like for example, if you look at the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he didn't come out uh, and say to uh, to uh, uh, to these three successors, to Abu Bakr, uh, Al, um, Abu Bakr, Amr, and Uthman, that I believe you are kufar, and this is not in their in, in their books, and neither is in our books. He doesn't. I mean, if you look carefully, he actually prays behind those people, and in Islam, if you pray behind the disbeliever, your prayer is invalid. Uh, in fact, more than that, he Ali had two sons. One of them he named. He had more than two sons. Sorry, but I mean. Uh, two sons who he specifically named Abu Bakr and Umar. Uh, in addition to that, you know, Ali had uh, married his daughter to Umar ibn Khattab, Umm Kulthum. So he married her off to uh, this man. And clearly, if this uh, was a disbeliever, then it wouldn't be a legitimate marriage in Islam. So this would mean that he's doing something in Islam which is considered uh, basically allowing his daughter to do. Something which is completely haram. These are some things which Sunnis would reply and say, look, this is your, the, the issue with your thesis. Yeah? Or the thesis that the Sahaba are not uh, basically uh, Muslim. But having said this also, the Qur'an makes it clear. The Qur'an itself makes it clear. If we look at Surah Al-Fatih, chapter number 48 of the Qur'an, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself, he says, لَقَدْ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِذْ يُبَيْعَوْنَكَ تَحْتَ الشَّجَرَةِ وَعَلِمَ مَا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ وَجَعْلَ مِنْ دُونِ ذَلِكَ فَتْحًا قَلِيبًا He said that. Certainly Allah has, he's no, he knows 
the Sunni would argue. He knows that uh, Allah, sorry, Allah is pleased with those people who have made bay'ah to you under the tree. Bay'ah means the Pledge of Allegiance. And there's no difference of opinion that these individuals included Uthman and included uh, included Abu Bakr and, and these big names that basically the Sunnis take as big names and the Shias, some of them, I would say, quite openly, excommunicate from the faith altogether. So if we look at the Qur'an, the Qur'an makes it very clear and there are other verses. Like in the final verse of that very chapter, chapter 48, it says, Muhammad Rasulullah, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ أَشِدَّ عَلَى الْكُفَارِ رَحْمَةً بَيْنَهُمْ And it continues, the verses continue. So it says that Prophet Muhammad is the Rasul of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the ones who have believed with him are uh, basically, and it details so many different things, uh, good traits, we would say, of the Sahaba. Now, having said that, having spoken about the second major difference, I'll talk now about the third major difference. The third major difference is, and it's a very big one, Imama. Now, Imama, if you look at the Islamic tradition, yeah, if you look at the Islamic tradition, you'll find that Muslims all agree that there are six pillars of Iman. There are five pillars of Islam, six pillars of Iman. And Tu'min Billah, Malaikati, Kutubi Rusuli, William Al Akhir, Qadr Khairi, that you believe in Allah and His and His angels and His messengers, etc., etc., etc. Yeah, there are six pillars of Iman, which is faith. Now we would consider these six pillars of faith as the what you would say the pillars or the um, foundations of our creedal belief. All Muslims would say that. Shias now have an addition to this. What they say is that we believe in Imama. Imama is the idea that there are 12 Imams. Imams means, kind of, it linguistically means leaders or people to be followed. There are 12 Imams beginning with Ali ibn Abi Talib and ending with uh, Muhammad ibn Hassan Askari that all of these 12 Imams are number one, infallible, that they're incapable of making mistakes. Number two, that they have all knowledge. Number three, that they can, some people say that they have control of the dharrat, even the atoms of creation, they can have control of it, and so on and so forth. So these 12 Imams, according to the Shia, are incredibly, um, basically, perfect. They are perfect in every way, shape, and form. Um, and we have to follow them, according to Shias, in order to seek to get salvation. In order to get salvation. Now, the question that Sunnis pose to Shias now is, if we look at the Qur'an, from the beginning of the Qur'an to the end of the Qur'an, we will, we will find many mentions, not just one mention, but many mentions of all of the foundational elements of, uh, of Aqidah or faith. We will find many mentions of... Uh, like, for example, the Day of Judgment, Allah, this is, all the things I've just mentioned, the things which are the six pillars of him. But when you try and do the same thing for Imama, the question now is, where does the Qur'an mention Imama? From the beginning of it to the end of it. Now, clearly, those ancient, probably, um, hopefully, they don't exist, uh, th this opinion is not present nowadays, but these maybe classical-minded Shias, Orthodox uh, Shias, or whatever you want to call them, maybe I shouldn't call them Orthodox, maybe extremist Shias, they will say maybe the Qur'an is not preserved, the, the original Qur'an had 18,000 verses and you know, uh, therefore you know, that those verses that talk about Imam are, have been lifted. But for those Shias who maintain that the Qur'an is preserved and that the Qur'an has not been changed, which hopefully I will say is the majority, the question now is how would they respond to, to the fact that Imam, or the idea of uh, the leadership of the Twelve um, is not mentioned anywhere in the Qur'an in any explicit way at all. And this is very, very clear for all to see. Um, so this is a question that Sunnis have been historically posing to Shias for a very, very long time. And Shias have been uh, grappling with it. And you could say that they've been re referencing some ayat, maybe in Surah Al-Ma'idah, uh, some ayat in other places which have vague references or ambiguous references. Uh, which are not clear and definitely don't mention any of the names of any of the 12 Imams beginning from Ali ibn Abi Talib and ending with Muhammad uh, ibn Hassan Askari who by the way in a book written by a Tusi who is one of the biggest Shia scholars uh, in this field he says that in page in the book called Ghaiba page number 74 he says that this man Hassan Askari who's the 11th Imam didn't have any children anyways so there would be 11 Imams 
uh, and this would pose real problems if this if this is true for the fact that there are twelve. And this is obviously a Shia uh, scholar. But having said this, the question now would be where did the idea come from? And um, of Imam, if it didn't come from the Quran, if it didn't come from the Prophet himself, uh, Prophet himself if it didn't come from, so what are the alternate theories? And there are some controversial theories out there. I'm not saying I subscribe to anyone in particular, but I'm saying I put them out there for education purposes. And that one theory, according to uh, some people, uh, Shia and Sunnah actually, Shia and Sunnah, and I'll substantiate my claim, is that the the idea of Imam actually came from a human being called Abdullah ibn Sabah. And I hope the Shia, if you're watching this, you're not going to switch off and get angry because I know you've heard this probably before. Okay? I know you've heard this before. I'm not trying to say that it's true or it's false. I'm just saying it's an idea. It's in the scholarly works of Shias and Sunnah. For example, Abdullah ibn Sabah has been said by someone called Al Qummi, who is a Shia scholar, who wrote a book. Um, uh, and in th page 30, it's called Firaq uh, al-Shia. And this book, in page 32 of the book, it says that he, Abdullah bin Sabah, is awwal man adh, uh, awwal man shahida. He's the first person to testify bi, uh, bi fardit Imam Ali alayhi salam wa adhara al-bara'a ta'ala a'da'ihi. He says that he is the first. This is exactly what he says in page 32. He says... That he, i.e., Abdullah bin Sabah, is the first person to uh, say that it's obligatory to believe in the Imama, and he uses exactly the word Imama of Ali, and he says Alayhi Salam because he is a Shia, uh, and uh, there have been Sunnis who have said the same thing. Alayhi Salam is not necessarily something I'm uh, attacking anyone on. He says that, and he is the first person to really show. Animosity, yeah, against those who people who uh, who he says are the enemies of Ali, who he he's referring to obviously, Ahmad Abu Bakr, etc. So the there are competing theories of how this um, idea of Imam has actually entered the Islamic framework or has entered uh, the minds of people who promote the idea, and this is one theory, and certainly it's been mentioned by Sunnis and Shia. Uh, but there are other theories, and um, I'm not here to make, have you know have a complete discussion about that. But it's important for us to know not only the differences, but perhaps where the differences came from as well. Um, one of the issues, really, one we've talked about one issue, which is that you wouldn't be able to find a verse which is unequivocal and is unambiguous that talks about the imams in any certain way. And the other, so that's one issue. But another issue is really a creedal issue. If we say that, as many have said, and I'll put some references in the description box for those who really want to do this research, that the Imam, for example, knows everything. If we say that the Imams know everything, they know everything. This is what Khomeini says, this is what many of the scholars, classical and contemporary, have said about the Imams. They know everything. If this is the case, as some Sunnis have argued, if this is the case that you're saying that the Imams know everything, then would that suggest that they are more knowledge than the Prophet Muhammad? So I'll say, no, in fact, the Prophet Muhammad knows everything as well. I say, okay, fine. Let's take this and let's put it to the standard of the Quran. You see, the Quran in chapter number 46, verse number 8, it says, to the Prophet Muhammad, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, قُلْ مَا كُنْتُ بِدْعَ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ وَمَا كُنْتُ أَدْرِ مَا يُفْعَلُ بِي وَلَا بِكُمْ he says to the Prophet Muhammad, say I'm not an innovation of the Prophet, so I'm not something new, not coming with a new message. And I don't know what's going to happen to me, and I don't know what's going to happen to you. So he says, I don't know something. Yeah, so the Prophet Muhammad has been told, I don't know something. In other words, if you're saying they know everything, how comes, and the Prophet Muhammad is not exempt from this knowledge of everything, then how comes in the Quran it says, that he doesn't know certain things. Yes, For example, chapter 79 of the Quran, the last couple of verses, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they ask you about the hour, when will it be pegged? Say, who are you? Who are you, O Prophet Muhammad sallallahu uh, to know this kind of information? And this thing is mentioned, there's lots of things. It says that we haven't taught him shar, which means 
poetry. So there's lots of things the Prophet doesn't know. Yeah? We're not saying that Prophet Muhammad sallam, that's the normative position, knows everything. And if we did, we'd, be, we'd have real troubles justifying that position uh, in the light of the verses of the Qur'an. But the question would then remain, another question would remain, if we're saying that the Imams know everything, and that Allah knows everything, then does that mean that the Imams have the same knowledge as Allah? Or not? But this is another argument that, uh, that, uh, that Sunnis put forward. If you say that Allah knows everything, because there's nothing more than everything to know, and that the Imams know everything, that would suggest that the Imams and Allah have the same knowledge. Now, the Shia does have a counter to this, just to be clear, and remember this is an education video. I know it's a very biased one, but obviously I'm a Sunni, so I'm going to be very biased. But the truth is, guys, I'll be honest with you, bias is always going to be a part of the discussion. Yeah? And I'm not going to lie to you here and say that I'm not biased. I'm biased, right? But bias doesn't mean that it's not going to be true what I say. Because you can have a bias which is true. The point is, if we say that Allah knows everything and that the Imams know everything, that would suggest that they have the same knowledge. Okay? Now, the Shia would come about and say, look, actually, that's not true. Uh, you're conceptualizing it incorrectly. So why? The reason why is because if actually there's something that the Allah has that the Imams don't have, which is what you call samadiyyah. You know, qulhu allahu ahad, allahu, allahu samad. A samad means that everything relies upon Allah and Allah doesn't rely upon anyone. Whereas the Imams all rely upon Allah and uh, Allah does not rely upon the Imams. That's what they say. This is, a, this is a clear difference. This is what differentiates the Imams from the Prophet Muhammad, from the Prophet Muhammad, from the Imams. Say so fine, but that does not negate the Shia would then argue, or the Sunni would then argue, the fact that you, you are saying that they have the same knowledge. Just to, just because one is more reliant than the other, or one is reliant on the other, and the other is not reliant on one, doesn't mean that they don't have the same knowledge. If you subscribe to this belief. So, this is the kind of um, discussion you'll find between Sunni and Shia. This is the traditional discussion that's been going on for many, many uh, hundreds of thousand years, now 1,400 years, or 1,300, whatever it is, is years. And, and it's important for us as consumers of the truth to have an, an understanding of that. And because it is the occasion of Ashura, today is basically the 10th day of Muharram, unless this video has been recorded uh, or you're watching it some other time, which is very, very possible. But um, it's the 10th day of Muharram is Ashura. And so on this occasion, I thought I would make it elucidate on the differences between. So people do not understand, like, you know, understand what is exactly the main, what, what is differentiating. Is it really the fact that it was only the successor of the Prophet? And so, it's not that. It isn't that. These are the, the main differences between Sunni and Shia. And uh, I want to add just one more thing before I end. Uh, end. Since, it is the, um, since it is basically Ashura, and stuff like that. Someone might ask, what is Ashura? As a Sunni, what you're meant to do is fast. Fasting in Ashura, it cleanses your sins for the previous year, etc. It does lots of good things for you. For the Shiite, uh, it's, it's clear that I think there is evidence, historical evidence, that basically uh, Al Hussein he died in Ashura on this day. Uh, and so they, 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 what they're doing when they're cutting themselves and things, just to be clear to the people, is that Shias in particular are mourning the death of Hussein or they believe that this is a martyrdom that deserves to be uh, mourned. But the question would then remain, who is the ones, or who are the ones who killed uh, Al-Hussein? And I, I want to just read a couple of things here, because I think it is an interesting thing. And I'm not saying this again, once again, to be polemical. I'm, I'm just saying this because it's something I've, I've come across. Al-Musawi is one of the Shia scholars, and he says, well, how did he, know? Yeah, he mentions a couple of uh, verses, uh, some verses, and some, sorry, some athar, some ahadith. And then says, وَهَذِهِ النُّسُوسِ تُبَيِّنْ لَنَا مَنْ هُمْ قَتَلَةُ الْحُسَيْنِ الْحَقِّقِيُونَ إِنَّهُمْ شِيَعَاتُهُ أَيْ أَجْدَادُنَا فَلِمَاذَا نُحَمِّلْ أَهْلِ السُنَّةِ الْمَسْؤُولِيَ He says that certainly these evidences or these uh, things show to us that who are the, the true killers of uh, Al-Hussein and uh, he says that it was our grandfather or goes, not our grandfather, our grandfathers or our forefathers, yeah? So he says there's no reason to, um, to, to basically blame Ahl Sunnah or the Sunni people for that. Um, and he said, and someone else, his name is As Sayyid Mohsin Al Amin. He says, "Baya Al Hussein Ahl Al Iraq, Ashrun Alfan, Ghadaru Bih, Wa Kharaju Alayh, 
خرج عليه وبيعته في أعناقهم قتلوا. And this is in a book called Ayan al-Shia, al-Qism al-Awwal, the first juz and the page number I think is 32. So the point is, there's there's a question of who killed him. This is one ongoing debate. I've just given you two sources just to give you a taste of um, some competing opinions within Shia school of thought as to who killed al Hussein. The point is he, he, was, he was martyred, we believe. And the thing is, I don't want anyone to think in their mind that uh, Sunnis don't love Ahlul Bayt. As Sunnis, the thing is, we have a positive, we have a beautiful love for Ahlul Bayt, or for Ali, Hassan, Hussein, and all of And we have tremendous respect for the Aima, even that they refer to. Because they were historical, some of them were historical characters, except for obviously some that I've just mentioned are not. Some of them are not historical characters, but some of them are historical characters like Jaffa al-Sadiq. We believe that we, our attitude towards the Imams is that we have a positive, we think that these were knowledgeable human beings. But we don't believe that those Imams ever claimed infallibility or divine uh, or supernatural metaphysical kind of thing, uh, uh, yani traits or attributes. With that, I do conclude. And, and I hope that you're going to subscribe. And I hope that you're going to... And listen, if any Shia wants to get in contact with me to ask me questions, you can Facebook me because uh, I don't mind answering messages uh, from anyone. And this is not just Shia, it's a Christian, Jewish, any human being wants to, to get in contact with us. You can message us on Facebook. My thing is on top of the on, on my channel, South Education. You can come on and message me, inshallah. I'll be very happy to answer any of your questions. And um, I hope you haven't offended anybody. I just genuinely did this because I felt there was a need to um, to educate people. I, I wanted to bring maybe a more specialist person in Shiaism to talk about this, uh, but then uh, I, I got in contact with a few of them, and then some of them they, they declined. But Allahu Allahu uh, Alam, he he maybe this is uh, going to be beneficial to you guys, and hopefully I'll see you soon.